Hello everyone, this is going to be 5.1, The New Government Finds Its Way. So we're going to be going from uh, George Washington all the way through John Adams in this one. So we're going to start with the primary source from John Adams who once said, The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And if this cannot be inspired into our people in a greater measure than they have it now, they may change their rulers and the forms of government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. They will only exchange tyrants and tyrannies. Basically saying, you need virtue in order to have a functioning republic like the United States was. Our objectives, we are going to describe how Washington's administration built the federal government. We are going to analyze Hamilton's plans for the economy and opposition to those plans. We are going to explain how a two-party system came about. We only had one party at the start of our uh, country, and now, of course, we have many. We are going to describe the relationship between, excuse me, between America, Britain, France, and Spain. It's not a good idea when the teacher starts yawning at the beginning of these. Okay, we're going to analyze how political parties' debates over foreign policy further divided them as well. So, we're going to start with the creation of a new government. This is very important stuff. We had won the American Revolution. We had created a new government and then created another new government after that. Uh, we still had huge issues to resolve, though. For instance, we were terribly in debt. We owed money both to France and to England. Even though we beat them in the American Revolution, we still owed them money as part of our deal, uh, as part of the Treaty of Paris. Uh, if we wanted to defend ourselves, we had very little in the way of military except for the, the local militia that we could call up. And also, most countries had very little, if any, respect for us. Some even refused to acknowledge us as a country. So this is America at its foundation. You'll notice that uh, a lot of uh, states like Virginia actually go all the way west of the Mississippi River. They're going to change that actually very soon uh, as part of creating new states in our, in our country. So we did have a few things going for us. We had George Washington. We had strong leaders uh, as our first president of the United States. He is also the only president to have ever been elected by the Electoral College unanimously, getting every vote. His vice president was John Adams of Massachusetts, considered one of the great legal scholars of the revolution. Uh, and most importantly, Washington's administration, the people who were working in his branch of office, set many precedents. A precedent is an important term that we're about to get to, but uh, he set many of them during his time. So a precedent is an earlier event or action that can be regarded as an example to follow. Basically, people looked at what Washington did and said, we should do that because he did it. So here is our first president, George Washington, president from 1789 to 1797. He was a two-term president. Uh, he was from Virginia, where he was a farmer, a soldier, uh, a delegate to the Continental Congress, uh, a, co a delegate to the Constitutional Congress, and also commander of the uh, American forces during the Revolution. Really the only man who could have united all the different factions within our country as president to be our first president. Uh, he's also known for his false teeth. If you ever wonder why he sort of looks a little sour in his painting right here, that's actually because he has spring-loaded false teeth in his mouth right there. Uh, and they are made of human teeth, mainly his human teeth. Um, they are made of hippopotamus bone. They are made of ivory. They are not, as it turns out, made of wood. Now, the Constitution also had a few uh, things that needed to be sort of clearly defined. For instance, the Constitution said there should be a Supreme Court in our country, um, and it said that uh, there should be smaller courts. However, uh, it left it to Congress to say how that would happen. James Madison, who is one of the founders of the American Constitution, was now a congressman from Virginia, and he took it upon himself to clarify this. So Madison helped to write the Judiciary Act of 1789, which created the Federal Courts of the United States, the Supreme Court, and also assigned the Attorney General of the United States, um, part of the Presidential Cabinet. Um, the Attorney General is basically the highest law enforcement official in the land, uh, the nation's chief lawyer. John Jay of New York became our first Chief Justice. So here's John Jay, 1745 to 1829. Uh, he is from New York City, where he had been in the Second Continental Congress. 
He was our main diplomat. Uh, he also helped write the Federalist Papers. He was a chief abolitionist. And after he retired from the Supreme Court, he was governor of New York as well. Now, Washington formed this cabinet where the heads of major departments would act as advisors to the president. So um, the Constitution says he will have, uh, you know, people to help him as necessary. But he made it more official and said, I'm going to have these people and these people to help me uh, with things like foreign affairs, the military, finance, uh, and law. Uh, we had a secretary of state who conducted foreign policy. That was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, one of our most able diplomats at that time. We had a Secretary of War who sup supervised our national defense. Uh, at this time, our first one was Henry Knox, who had been Washington's old artillery chief during the war. We had the Treasury Department, han who handled the nation's finances. That was, of course, Alexander Hamilton. And then we had the Attorney General, whose job it was to prosecute and defend cases on behalf of the country uh, to represent the United States in legal matters. Now, the cabinet was not recognized by law technically until 1907, but thanks to this idea of precedent, every president after Washington had one. So here are the original cabinet along uh, with uh, George Washington, the president of the United States. And we are going to look now into our nation's debt. So this is, we're getting into the stuff now that divided our country, and we're going to start with one of the things that divided our country had a name, and that was that name was... Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton had a big task as Secretary of the Treasury. Our nation was swimming in debt, and we hadn't done a very good job of controlling it or deciding what to do with it. So he had to organize our debt uh, and get our country stable economically. Now, Hamilton is a firm believer in having a strong national government. So he wanted a strong national government to have the ability to uh, take over the debt of the states. This is what's called assuming states' debts. Um, however, he met a lot of resistance from the small government people, the Anti-Federalists, uh, who believed that uh, this would empower the federal government to a greater degree than they were comfortable with. Now, Washington's, uh, sorry, Hamilton's plans, Hamilton's plan focused on the big cities and on uh, wealthy merchants uh, and on a powerful federal government. He saw... Uh, accumulating debt is almost a positive thing that, you know, debt meant that we had to trade with other countries. Uh, debt meant that we could borrow from other countries. Uh, and trade stimulated the economy. And so he said, instead of paying off debts, we are going to sell government bonds and use those to pay down the debt. And a bond is where you donate funds to the American government, and the American government will pay you back later with interest. And so he was convincing a lot of wealthy Americans to sort of join on board with this. Uh, in order to pay them back, he said we should have new taxes. Now, this is dangerous territory. If you remember, we just fought a war based on taxes. So he especially wanted to tax things coming in from outside the United States called tariffs. Um, that would be good for us because it would encourage people to buy more locally. He also wanted Congress to help start a national bank. Uh, this uh, would be sort of based on what the Bank of England was. He wanted a bank of the United States. Uh, and this would regulate the state banks. It would be a place where the U.S. could put their money. Uh, and it would further strengthen the national government to have this sort of giant bank that uh, deals with all the money and the currency and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, as you can tell by the fact that there's a building, spoiler, I guess we got one, at least for a little while. This is the first Bank of the United States in Philadelphia. Now, the way Hamilton saw it, his plan was really good. It established uh, our financial cred. We, we, we could uh, prove that we were an actual country to a lot of these uh, outside countries. Uh, we, uh, it would make it easier for us to borrow money and to do trade in the future. Uh, it would help support, uh, get support from the wealthiest of Americans, uh, who he saw as the, uh, the best Americans to get on our side. Uh, he also, uh, thought that it would make his investors very wealthy, uh, which would encourage them to invest further. Now, his plan would move money away from the poor farmers, uh, and this was, uh, again, trouble brewing a little bit right here. Um, he saw the merchants uh, and the industry as the place where the money was coming from and therefore the most important thing to focus on. However, um, he uh, was willing to tax the southern poor farmers. Most of America's debt 
the debt that we owed to other countries uh, was, and the, that we owed to wealthy Americans was owed to merchants in the uh, American Northeast. So uh, this had big consequences for the people that he was kind of dissing right here, which are farmers and Southerners. And farmers and Southerners were sort of the bedrock of the Anti-Federalist uh, people, which made them very upset with Hamilton and his plan. So that is just about all the economics I can take for this moment right here. The southern states were not a huge fan of this plan because they were mostly farmers, and uh, his plan either ignored farmers or tended to tax farmers and took away their power in general. Also, some of these southern states had already mostly paid off their debt, so if the national government took over paying all of the national debt, including the state debts, uh, they would have to pay taxes to, you know, pay off Massachusetts' debt. And they weren't interested in that. They weren't interested in the, the sort of big country viewpoint. They were interested in their individual states. Also, Hamilton was going way outside the powers of the Constitution. Nowhere in the federal Constitution does it say that the United States has the power to create a national bank. Uh, or to do any of the other stuff that he is doing. However, Hamilton had a belief in what we call a loose construction of the Constitution, which is he thought that the Constitution uh, had certain loopholes within it where he could uh, use implied, unspoken powers within the document to do what he wanted to do. That is what Hamilton believed. People like Thomas Jefferson and Madison, who looked at the Constitution more strictly, with what's called uh, a strict construction of the Constitution, believe that the federal government only had the powers that are specifically mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, Hamilton thought that there are many more powers the federal government could use, but they just weren't mentioned in the Constitution specifically. Eventually, Hamilton got this debt plan through, not by forcing it, but by compromising so Hamilton got something that he wanted. Meanwhile, the Southern Anti-Federalists got something that they wanted. Um, Hamilton promised that in exchange for uh, Congress approving his plan uh, and the Southerners helping him out, he would give the Southerners the, the, the push of the New York uh, congressman to uh, set up the nation's capital in the South uh, on the Potomac River in Virginia. Uh, and this is what they wanted. The Southerners wanted this because they wanted the the uh, nation's capital be down south somewhere. So here is what we eventually got with Washington, D.C. Now, Hamilton uh, further caused trouble with this first tax, an excise tax. An excise tax is a tax <clears throat> specifically on one good, uh, and so uh, are on certain luxury goods. Uh, and so his first excise tax was a tax on whiskey. Now, whiskey was an interesting thing because whiskey is easy to make, it's easy to transport, uh, and it gets the farmers who make it a better price than they would get just selling the wheat that whiskey is made from. So farmers love making and selling whiskey. It's very uh, economically beneficial. However, uh, when he came in and said, we're going to start taxing whiskey, they heard that we are taxing you because we can and because we don't want to tax the wealthy merchants. Uh, farmers resisted by actually attacking the tax collectors and raising up an army, basically. Remember, just like uh, with uh, Shays' Rebellion, a lot of these guys are veterans of the American Revolution and have a very distinct sense of, of what is fair and what is unfair. And new taxes that specifically go after certain citizens in America felt very unfair to these men. This is called, by the way, the Whiskey Rebellion. Now, George Washington personally led 12,000 militiamen out to put down this Whiskey Rebellion, and this is the only time we've ever had an acting sitting president uh, lead troops into battle. Uh, and as soon as the uh, rebels saw George Washington riding towards them in front of 12,000 men, they put down their guns very quickly, partially because they were like, hey, it's Washington, we love that guy. Uh, and so the rebellion very quickly dried up, um, and hardly anyone was arrested. Only two people were actually convicted out of the hundreds or even thousands that were rebelling. Um, however, it did show the power of the federal government and it also showed the deep divisions between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists at this time. 
So here's Washington leading troops out against the Whiskey Rebels with Hamilton as his second in command again. Uh, like I said, this is the only time that we've actually had a president in power who leads troops into battle. Now, let's see the outcome of all this political division, which is the two-party system. America very soon began to split into political factions. This is actually something that a lot of the founding fathers, including Washington, really didn't want to happen, but our disagreements were too big. So the two parties are those who wanted to have a strong federal government and those who wanted a weak federal government and strong state governments. And this is one of the de defining and even ongoing, uh, up through today, arguments about our country is uh, what should we have? Uh, who should have more power? Now, Federalists said that the Whiskey Rebellion was uh, because of anti-Federalist clubs known as Democratic Societies. Um, however, Jefferson and Madison defended them, saying that they were the voice of the people and that the people had the right to protest, according to the First Amendment, when they felt that their rights were being uh, overlooked or taken advantage of. Eventually, all of this led to two political parties. Um, the founders, like I said, had wanted to avoid these. This is why um, we didn't take into account at first that you could have uh, a president of one party and a vice president of another because we didn't think that our government was going to act like that, but it did. Uh, and so we had to sort of fix things along the way. They thought that parties threatened national unity, um, but we had national disagreements. So, yeah, I guess they did threaten national unity, but we weren't united at this point. Uh, Federalists uh, included George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams. They were the big ones up at the top. Uh, Democratic Republicans were led by Jefferson, Madison, uh, and Sam Adams, guys like that. Now, Federalists were mainly from the North, and mainly they were merchants, meaning that they were traders and sellers and maybe industrialists and entrepreneurs. Um, the Federalists were generally in charge of industry and trade. Uh, they wanted much more power going to the federal government and had a loose construction of the Constitution. Democratic Republicans were mainly from the South and were mainly farmers, either large landowners or self-sustaining small farmers. They mostly wanted more power in the state governments, and they believed in a stricter version of the Constitution, where the Constitution says what it says. Now, this is, of course, uh, a uh, small joke, but I like that joke anyway. Anyway, so uh, let's look at domestic and foreign affairs. This also helped divide us. So many of the difficulties of creating a new country was trying to make other countries believe in us and take us seriously as a new legit nation. Also, by 1793, we had the problem that Britain and France were starting to go to war against each other, and both of them kind of looked to America to see what, what side we would fall on, so it's going to be very hard for America to stay neutral in this sort of situation. After the American Revolution, however, America had taken over the Northwest Territory, and we were still having trouble with Britain in that area. The British still held onto their forts, uh, partially because we didn't have the army to force them out, uh, and they also gave guns and ammunition to the Native Americans who lived in the area. This is going to be a problem all the way up through the War of 1812. In 1790, in 1791, uh, Little Turtle actually defeated American troops sent by Washington to stop the attacks in the West. In 1794, Little Turtle was defeated at the Battle of Fallen Timbers by a man named Mad Anthony Wayne. Um, the Native American leaders eventually gave up their claims to the Northwest Territory after this, but we're still going to see that Native Americans will rise up and rebel against the Americans uh, up through later years. So here's Little Turtle who said, My forefather kindled the first fire at Detroit. From thence he extended his lines to the headwaters of the Scioto, from thence to its mouth, from thence down the Ohio, to the mouth of the Wabash, and from thence to Chicago on Lake Michigan, saying that basically my family's been here for a long time. Mad Anthony Wayne, however, said, Issue the order, sir, and I will storm hell. Now, in 1789, the French people overthrew the French king in the French Revolution. Many Americans thought this was a great idea. It was like, hey, there, there's another one of us out there. Uh, a continuation of the ideas of republicanism taking, uh, taking charge around the world. However, it kind of fell apart very quickly. So, after the death of the French king and the French queen, 
Um, they tried to create a Republican government, but it quickly fell apart uh, and developed in what is known as the Reign of Terror, where thousands upon thousands of French people were losing their heads to the guillotine. Uh, and eventually it devolved to the point where they had to call uh, royalty back, and they reinstated the French king after Napoleon was in charge. Uh, also during this time, France declared war on England, and France, being our ally from the American Revolution, expected us to help them like they had helped us. So here is the death of King Louis XVI. Americans were divided on this whole issue. Democratic Republicans were much more supportive of the French Revolution. They weren't in favor of people losing their heads, but they said, you know what, that is the way that sometimes Republicans, or not Republicans, I'm sorry, that republics get made. They are, you know, founding a new republic is a messy thing. Uh, Federalists thought that this was anarchy, that this was, you know, the people run amok. Uh, and they were worried that the Democratic Republicans had similar intentions for the United States. Uh, we also didn't really have much of an army or a navy to go help out the French at this time. Eventually, Washington decided that we were not ready to join into this war between these two great countries. And so uh, in 1793, he declared America neutral. Uh, and this was another precedent. We would not get involved in foreign wars until about uh, 1917, give or take. Now, Britain and France were very, both very upset at our neutrality, and both uh, countries started to take over American ships at sea and started to kidnap our sailors with what is called impressment. That is going to become important when we get to the War of 1812. Now, we did try to keep the peace between these two countries. So John Jay, one of our best negotiators and also the future Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, uh, was sent to England by Washington to help make a treaty. Uh, the Jay Treaty of 1794 ended uh, the hostilities between our countries, uh, and they said that basically England would give up their forts in the West, and America would help to pay back debts from before the Revolution. Uh, the treaty passed, but very closely. Democratic Republicans, uh, or uh, the Anti-Federalists uh, at that time, thought that this was us selling out to England. In 1795, America made a treaty with Spain so that we could use the Mississippi River, uh, and along with the removal of British forts and the ability to use that river, uh, we started to see an increase of people heading west. By 1800, over 400,000 Americans lived in the west. Now, Washington won re-election in 1792. However, by 1796, uh, he was getting tired, he was getting old, he was not feeling well, uh, and also he didn't want to keep being American president for the rest of his life. He thought it set a bad, here's that important word again, precedent. He thought that if he gave up his power after two terms, it would show that the president is not a king. And so uh, he retired after two terms, a very important idea. In his farewell address, Washington called again for our country to unite, our political parties to unite. He also said, Avoid getting into entangling alliances with other countries. Basically, avoid getting into uh, treaties and, and wars with other countries. And he left very popular. So this is in the uh, capital, Rotunda Dome, uh, and it is called the Apotheosis of Washington. Washington becoming a god. That's what apotheosis means. Now let's look at foreign policy and John Adams. In 1796, John Adams beat Thomas Jefferson for the presidency. It was a close thing, but he did it. Um, the nation generally voted across regional lines, and it really goes to show, you know, Washington was, was voted in both times with a very large majority. Um, by the time we get to Adams, though, we start to see the party lines and the regional lines start to split. The South went for Jefferson, the North went for John Adams. However, the Constitution hadn't had the idea that political parties would be a thing. So the Constitution basically says first place gets to be president, second place gets to be vice president. So we have a uh, we have two men who do not like each other at this time, um, are of different political parties, and are one is president, one is vice president. Imagine if that happened today. So we have our second president, John Adams, president from 1797 to 1801. 
He's from Massachusetts, where he was a lawyer. He was a member of the Constitutional Conventions. He was a minister to the Netherlands, to Great Britain, uh, and he was vice president of the United States. So he was a well-traveled, very intelligent man. Uh, interestingly, he died uh, 50 years to the day after he signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, July 4th, 1826. Um, and he uh, died the same day as Thomas Jefferson. His last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. Unfortunately, he was a f wrong by a few hours. Thomas Jefferson died a few hours before he did. Now, John Adams was not Washington. He was very honest, very dedicated. He was thought of as a great, you know, um, leader and a great scholar. However, he was also very arrogant, very stubborn, and had a tendency to make enemies pretty quickly. Um, even within his own party, he fired Hamilton pretty quickly. Um, so he did not get along with everybody else. Uh, and the lack of friends and political allies weakened his administration. Now, America did briefly unite behind Adams when the French started stealing our ships after we made the Jay Treaty with England. Uh, John Adams sent diplomats to France to sort this all out. However, when they tried to meet with the French foreign minister, they met, uh, instead they were sent to three guys who basically stuck out their hand and said, okay, you want to talk to the French foreign minister? You've got to pay us, like basically $250,000. Um, these guys who were not mentioned by name were called Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z. And after America refused publicly, uh, this XYZ affair really made a lot of Americans angry against France, uh, to the point where uh, it was egg in the face of a lot of the, the Democratic Republicans, actually, that France would do this to us. Um, and also, we had a small, undeclared, what we called a quasi-war with the French during this time. Now, during this anti-French hysteria, Federalists uh, passed a series of laws meant to weaken their enemies. So they, they kind of blew it a little bit. They shot themselves in the foot. They used all the power that they were getting from the XYZ affair and this quasi-war with France and used it to go after their enemies. Not, not very, you know, forthright of them. Uh, so they passed what are called the Alien and the Sedition Acts. The Alien Act said that the president could deport any non-citizens who criticized the government. Basically, so if any French journalists came over here, they could be kicked out. Uh, he also increased the time it took to become a citizen to 14 years to make sure that uh, many non-citizens stayed non-citizens for a longer period of time. Meanwhile, the Sedition Act made it a crime to publicly criticize the federal government, uh, and both of these were pretty obviously trying to mess with the Democratic Republicans. By the election of 1800, the Alien and Sedition Acts were incredibly unpopular, uh, as were the taxes that Adams was passing. And so in 1800, uh, John Adams lost a very bitter election to Thomas Jefferson. Um, they both threw a lot of mud at each other. So don't think that, like, you know, mean-spirited elections are a modern idea. They're actually uh, way back then, too. However, Jefferson and the Democratic Republican Aaron Burr, who was running technically as Jefferson's vice president, both got the same number of electoral votes. Technically, in the Constitution, that means that these two guys, uh, if they both have the same number of electoral votes, it has to go to Congress, and Congress gets to decide who the new president is going to be. Federalists uh, looked to Alexander Hamilton, who was uh, out of power, but still the most prominent Federalist around. Uh, Hamilton did not like either man. He did not like Burr. He did not like Jefferson. However, he sided with Jefferson, and so the Federalists voted for Jefferson, and Jefferson got to be president. After this, the Constitution was changed so that electors voted separately for the president and for the vice president as a ticket and not as an individual. So here's Aaron Burr, 1756 to 1836, from Jersey. Everything is legal in New Jersey. Uh, he is a senator. He was vice president. He was also a soldier during the Revolution. Grandson of sinners in the, hang in the hands of an angry god's Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he was put on trial after killing Hamilton in a duel, but was let off on a technicality. He got, out, got off scot-free because he shot him in New Jersey, but was put on trial in New York. 
Eventually, he was also tried for treason after trying to get the Western states to secede so that he could become their leader. And this is when he was vice president. He was nearly tried and found guilty of treason. Now, this decision also ended up, like we said, costing Hamilton his life. Uh, Aaron Burr was so angry at Hamilton for backing Jefferson and later for stopping him from becoming the governor of New York that Burr challenged him to a duel and at Weehawken, New Jersey in 1804, uh, Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. So this is Aaron Burr not throwing away his shot. And I believe with that, I am fresh out of Hamilton references to make. I'm very sorry. <laughs> 